people. Okay, so I can't really see anybody. So um, uh, if you can't hear me or you can't see my slides, somebody shout out. Um, thanks so much for that introduction, Amy. That was that was really nice. Um, it's a, a real pleasure to be here um, sharing my research with you today. Um, before I get into the details of my work, I do want to stop and um, acknowledge some folks who have been really important to my work previously and who will continue to be uh, important to my work um, as I move forward. Sure it's going well. Oh, can we, Amy, can you get those muted maybe? Okay. Um, yeah, so I wanted to do some acknowledgements in the beginning. Um, I would like to, um, first of all, talk about Dave Tank and Mary Beth Latvis. Um, these two uh, folks have been working in Castileo with me um, for a number of years now, and I expect our collaborations to continue in time. Um, it's been just a, a real pleasure working with them, and um, uh, I've learned so much from Dave about Castilea, and I'm just thrilled that we're going to continue uh, doing our research together into the future. Um, so much of the work that I'm, I'm going to show today was uh, collected during my PhD, and, um, and so I want to acknowledge our funding sources and um, important um, societies and um, institutions that were um, important for the work that we did. Okay, so um, when I, the first thing I wanna do is really to um, introduce myself as a scientist. Uh, so I am a botanist and a plant systematist and an evolutionary biologist. And I know that that's kind of like a big mouthful of, of ways to define yourself, but I'm about to give you a few more phrases. Um, I'd like to define my work as um, the study of the diversity of organisms, uh, the relationships uh, among all of those organisms, and the nature and the origin of that diversity, both in the present and the past. And again, this is a big mouthful of words, but I think it's really beautifully illustrated with the, the figure on the left. So this is from a paper by Todd Stucey in 79. Um, where he kind of talks about the three major components of the systematist's work. Uh, taxonomy and classification is, is one component of that, and I think it's one that many people kind of glom onto as, as what the systematist does. Um, but systematists are also um, very interested in, in the study of phylogeny and the, evolu and the evolutionary relationships um, among organisms. But they're also very interested in the study of the process of evolution and trying to understand how this diversity that they're putting in their phylogeny and that they're putting into the classification, how that was really formed. And so um, these three kind of pillars are, are um, very important for the work that I do and very much the way that I think about how um, I do my science. So um, as a systematist, I, I use phylogenies to study speciation. And you know, many of us know what phylogenies are, but maybe some of us don't. So I wanna take just a quick second to orient us to how we use phylogenies. So um, these are branching diagrams that um, basically just depict the evolution of groups through time. So here I have a mock phylogeny that I just kind of made up. Um, and it's composed of branches and nodes. So branches are the horizontal lines and they um, connect to our groups of interest. And those groups could be individuals, they could be species or genera, it doesn't really matter. Um, but these horizontal lines are connected by, by nodes and these represent the common ancestors of any given branches. And so what this, um, what this diagram is showing us is the is the procedure of speciation. So uh, as you move through time, um, populations um, begin to diverge until they're very distinct from one another. And so I use phylogenies to study speciation by making comparisons um, across different nodes of the tree um, to observe what is different or similar about these branches. So for example, I might observe lineages that have been separated for a relatively long amount of time, um, comparing the orange group at the top with the purple group uh, at the bottom. Their common ancestor is, is relatively deep in time. 
Now, as an alternative, I might be uh, observing lineages that have been separated for a relatively short amount of time. So here I'm looking at individuals within the same group where the common ancestor uh, is much more recent in time. But to make any of these kinds of observations, um, one of the most important things that I need to be able to do is to distinguish species and to tell um, diverging populations or diverging lineages apart from one another. And so this is really one of the kind of core um, um, parts of, of my work that is um, at times very easy and at other times very challenging. So um, distinguishing species or species delimitation, as I said, can be incredibly easy. Um, you know, we all come from very diverse backgrounds, but we can very clearly look at all of these pictures and tell that we have a lot of very different species uh, illustrated on this slide. But sometimes distinguishing species can be extremely challenging. Uh, so this is one of my favorite examples of this. So, um, you know, I, I like to pose the question, how many species do you think uh, are in this slide? And, you know, if we look just at the morphology of these beetles, um, I think any number of us would say, well, it looks like one species. <laughs> they all look the same. But when we start looking at, it, at, at different attributes and traits and characteristics of these beetles, maybe we're looking at their genomes, maybe we're looking at their habitats or um, their, uh, you know, their behavior. Um, but we might begin to find that there are actually any number of different um, qualities that distinguish these lineages. So I think there's actually nine genera and 13 different species among the different images or the different beetles that are on this one slide. So there's a, a lot of different reasons why distinguishing these species can be difficult. So one example is when um, populations are in the earliest stages of the speciation process. We call these incipient species. Um, these are very young lineages where um, morphological, ecological, molecular distinctions um, are not necessarily consistent and easily discernible. But there are other cases where distinguishing species can be very challenging as well. So for example, um, even in very diverged populations composed of what we would call good species, we can have a hard time telling species apart when they're engaging in gene flow. So hybridizing lineages are another type of uh, scenario where distinguishing species is, is very hard. So in the last um, you know, several decades or so, I think many evolutionary biologists have been moving um, towards a very process-oriented view of trying to um, identify and describe species. Um, and we oftentimes like to use uh, this kind of illustration um, to um, describe what this process-oriented view looks like. So this is um, a figure from Kevin DeCaros' work in 2005. And what he's illustrating here is a, a very simplified version of what might be happening during speciation or diversification. So you can imagine, you can imagine that you know, at any point in time, there might be a, you know, one species composed of many populations. And as time goes by, um, different species criteria are acquired by those populations. And this criteria could be morphological, it could be uh, molecular or maybe ecological. But as more and more time goes by, more and more of these criteria are accumulated uh, and, the, and the populations begin to become more and more distinct from one another until at some point in the future or at some point in time, um, they're so distinct from one another. So it really depends on when we come and observe these populations during this continual process, uh, whether or not we're gonna be able to distinguish species. And this is really kind of the crux or the, the challenge um, in, in, in this part of systematics is trying to identify where or when in this process a lineage is. Um, but the beauty about uh, this kind of framework is that we no longer are relying on a single type of, of data um, or a single line of evidence to tell us where species boundaries are. Um, any kind of data can inform us of this. 
Um, and it sets up this really awesome framework as well, where we can we can start using all these different types of data to ask things about the process itself. So which criteria are acquired? Um, what order are these, I, these criteria acquired? These are um, outstanding questions about diversification and things that I'm really um, interested in trying to tackle. So um, I do wanna stop and point out that this linear bifurcating illustration with its nice, tidy, orderly acquisition of traits, this is very misleading. And I'm gonna get back to this a little later on. Um, but despite the fact that it is oversimplified, it's a very useful illustration um, to get the point across. So ultimately the goal of what I'm doing is trying to identify independently evolving lineages I do that by identifying criteria that distinguish the, these lineages. And then I use that information to try to characterize the process of speciation. So, um, you know, I've been, I've been doing this work in Castilea and, um, and it is just a fantastic uh, group of plants to be um, tackling these types of questions um, for, for one reason, uh, they're incredibly beautiful. <laughs> I mean, it is, uh, I think it's pretty much impossible to take a bad picture of Castilea. Um, uh, Castilea is the bright pink uh, fluffy flower here in the foreground. Um, this was a picture taken up in Canada. Um, and here is another just stunning photo. Um, amazing scenery almost always goes along with these big, bright, showy, beautiful flowers. Um, but not all Castilea looks like this. Um, these, these big showy uh, wildflowers um, are just some of the diversity that we do see in the group. Uh, so this collection of photos, um, I think really nicely represents some of the variation that we do see uh, in the genus Castilea. Um, a lot of different uh, shapes and colors and textures and forms um, do occur in the group. Uh, we have about 250 uh, named species that are distributed widely across um, North and South America, and they even pop over into Northeast Asia as well. Just a couple of species over there. Um, Castilea occurs uh, at a really, really broad ecological amplitude. So you can find it um, at very high elevations and very low elevations. You can find it in very dry places, very wet places. Um, very um, um, difficult soils types to exist in. I mean, Castilea is uh, really all over the place. Um, they also have a certain amount of notoriety among botanists. Um, for those of you that have seen my talks before, you've probably um, heard this quote, but I, I still get a kick out of it every time I read it. So I'll probably never stop using this. Um, but I like to read this quote from um, Harold Ricketts. Uh, wildflowers of the northeastern United States. He says, the genus Castilea is one of those that make botanists wish they had embraced some easy branch of science, such as theoretical physics. It is a western genus with at least 250 species, on the exact characteristics of which no two botanists seem able to agree. Fortunately for the readers of the present volume, this is from the northeastern United States, only four species are found in the Northeastern states and they are not hard to distinguish. So, um, uh, you know, when I first started my PhD, I was talking with Dave and I was like, Dave, I'm not sure I can handle Castilea. I'm super intimidated by them. I don't think I've ever successfully identified a Castilea. Uh, and he laughed and he said, no, you'll be fine. And, and, and I was, but if you are afraid of Castilea, maybe you should go to the Northeast and it will be a lot easier there. <laughs> Um, so there have been a number of kind of hypotheses about why taxonomy in Castilea is so difficult. Um, and many of them have to do with the molecular characteristics of, of Castilea and its, and its genome. So um, from a mole molecular perspective, the genus is of course very complex. So um, first of all, they're a really young lineage. We think that the common ancestor of Castilea is about uh, four to six million years old, which does sound pretty old, but, um, but, but really it's, it's quite young. And probably much of the diversity has been generated in the last you know, several hundred thousand years. 
Uh, there's wide, widespread polyploidy in the genus as well. And so um, these multiple ploidy levels um, occur not only within species, but across species as well. And we do see evidence of gene flow um, very frequently when uh, species co-occur. And this is the case even um, for putatively distantly related species. So this collection of, of pictures that I have here is a, a good example of this. Um, I was lucky enough to go into the White Mountains a couple of years ago and see this really amazing population uh, or this amazing location where Castilea linearifolia, they're the pink one on the left, Castilea pilosa were growing right next to one another and all over the place were these really amazing um, full-on intermediate morphs <laughs> uh, between these two um, species. And, and you know, this is this has been observed and is, and is regularly observed across, as far as I'm aware, across the, the entire range of the group. Um, but another factor that might be contributing to, to challenges in, in the genus that just really hasn't been explored a lot um, is the fact that Castilea are hemiparasites. So um, hemiparasites are, are still uh, fully capable of performing photosynthesis. Uh, this is why there's green tissue uh, in Castileas. Um, and we assume that they are all facultative uh, hemiparasites, meaning that they can survive without a host. Um, but most of our understanding about parasitism in the group is really um, organized around other members of the family um, that have received quite a lot of empirical and experimental attention. Um, and Castilea just really hasn't um, re received this quite so much. So we don't have a whole lot of uh, really great detail. So the images on the right side of the slide are um, the, the host or the parasitic connection between uh, Castilea and um, its host. I think in this case, it's Plantago. Um, this connection is made by uh, the formation of, a, of an organ called the hostorium. And then there's a really nice zoomed in picture of a hostorium of Castilea, Castilea levisecta on the bottom left of the slide. Um, and in the center of the slide, there's uh, some histo there's a histological section of a of a hostorium of striga. So this is um, an obligate uh, hemiparasite in the Orobenchaceae, um, and this really shows how the vascular tissue of the parasite uh, striga um, really kind of injects and punches into the vascular tissue um, of the host. So um, you know, there's a, there has been some work that, um, you know, is, is trying to understand what all moves between the host and the parasite. Um, but again, this has been done outside of Castilea and, and isn't really something that we, we know much about. Okay, so currently um, taxonomy in the genus is, is predominantly organized around morphology. So I wanted to break down um, the morphology of Castilea really quick. So this is um, kind of a, just an image of the, hab the general habit of Castilea. So this one has multiple stems and at the tip of each of these stems is an inflorescence composed of many flowers. And if we pull off one of those flowers and we break it down into its component parts, we'd find the bract, the calyx. This is a tubular calyx and a tubular corolla. And it's really the features of the calyx and the corolla that have um, kind of driven the, the organization of, of species in Castilea. So right now we're recognizing about nine different major morpha groups uh, within the genus. Um, four of these are monotypic and, and pretty odd relative uh, to the other five. Um, so those with the stars popping up above them are, are pretty unique. Uh, those three on the left have uh, variously been placed as different genera. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about more about them in the next slide. And then the one with the star on the right, the Plagiotoma E, um, this is a pretty unique looking um, um, species uh, with respect to its calyx. Um, the lobes are, are very irregular um, and, and very kind of asymmetric, uh, which is different from the rest of the group. 
Um, these four kind of oddballs are um, represented by a single uh, species. And so um, for most of this, this talk, I'm not really gonna be considering them much except for in the, the next few slides. Um, so really I wanna pay more close attention to um, the five main floral morphotypes that have been identified in, in the group. So we refer to these as subgenera. And then within each of these subgenera is a further organization of species into alliances or sections. And, and you know, there's this kind of implicit um, suggestion that these things that are grouped in alliances and, and grouped in um, subgenera are, are potentially closely related. So um, they also are expected to share some general biological similarities. So for example, the three morphogroups on the left, we suspect are primarily insect pollinated. Um, the one on the far left, Colacus, is, in, is composed entirely of annual species. And the, the next two are composed of uh, perennial species. And then the remaining two morphogroups with the long beaks are um, expected to be hummingbird pollinated. Uh, and these are almost entirely uh, perennial. So previous uh, hypotheses in, in, of relationships in Castileo were really um, um, built by Chuang and Heckard in, um, during their work in the 80s and 90s. They were at the Cal Academy um, and they were studying lots of different aspects of Castilea. Um, they were doing lots of chromosome counts and um, studying the floral morphologies and the seed types uh, in these lineages. And um, Chuang and Heckard uh, kind of generated our, our first hypotheses of groups. Now this isn't an actual kind of like molecular phylogeny. Um, and this is more just like a hypothetical set of relationships, but you can see that it's really geared very tightly to you know, these um, morphogroups. So, um, Clevelandia and Ophiocephalus were so distinct from the rest of the morphogroups that Chuang and Heckard definitely considered them to be different genera. Um, but Gentria, um, that, that kind of greeny yellow colored one, um, despite it's really curved over um, beak, you know, they suspected that it was part of the genus Castilea. And then the sub, what they called the subgenus Castilea was composed of the top four morphotypes. And, and they really suspected that each of these were um, independent lineages. And they also hypothesized that that uh, entirely annual group, the, the, the group Colacus, uh, was derived from a perennial background. So, um, so this was the prevailing kind of set of hypotheses um, into the 90s and the early 2000s when Dave Tanks, oh, sorry, I forgot I was gonna make these points. Uh, they suspected that the morphotypes are independent lineages and that the annuals are derived from perennials. So this was kind of the prevailing hypotheses that um, were in place when Dave started doing his work uh, in, the, in, in the early 2000s. So um, his interests were not just in the genus Castilea, but um, further out in the phylogeny. And um, he was the first one who really, who began to bring molecular data to the question of relationships and, and, and systematics in, in the group. Um, what his, his data uh, revealed was that these three really um, crazy looking uh, genera, Clevelandia, Ophiocephalus, and Gentria, um, were nested very solidly within the genus Castilea. And so, um, you know, should be recognized as, as part of the group. He also recovered um, the a grade of annuals uh, or the perennials being derived from a grade of annuals, um, which is in direct contrast, of course, to what Chong and Heckard had suggested. And then within that perennial clade of Castilea, um, he had uh, recovered those morphogroups placed in various places. Um, and this was the first suggestion that perhaps these morphogroups were not um, entirely indicative of, of relationships. So his data set um, did have limited sampling. Uh, he had uh, two loci from the chloroplast and, and three from the nuclear genome. Um, and in terms of species, he did expand, or you know, he had a pretty decent amount of, of sampling, but it is a small fraction of the, the total number of species in the group. 
Uh, again, he recovered this um, uh, pattern of perennials being derived from a grade of annuals. Um, the perennial morphotypes were scattered. And ultimately there was, a, there was very little support for any relationships within those perennial castileas, um, you know, which really set the stage for um, trying to gather more molecular data uh, to kind of uh, tackle these questions. And so that's what happened when, um, you know, I kind of joined the team. <laughs> so um, what I'm going to do now is, is, is basically bring you into the present with um, the data that uh, I collected during my PhD and that I've been um, working on ever since um, to tell you about what's happening currently with systematics in the group. So um, the first thing we wanted to do is to expand the sampling. Um, and in terms of the, the molecular data, um, we designed primers for the chloroplast and um, putative single copy nuclear markers. Um, so um, we developed an, quite a few of these primer pairs. And we also expanded the um, taxonomic sampling of the group. We did a couple of really massive um, field excursions um, to collect. And we also sampled from a lot of different herbaria to um, bump our sampling up to about 175 of the approximate 250 species. And then we took all that information and we inferred both plastid and nuclear phylogenies. So I'm gonna walk you through um, what these phylogenies are telling us and kind of what our, our general ideas and understanding of, of um, evolution in the group are right now. Um, so I'm gonna start out with our uh, chloroplast phylogeny. Um, this is a maximum likelihood phylogeny. There's very high backbone support, um, but minimal support within the clades, particularly at those shallowest positions. Um, this phylogeny has about 440, it has 447 tips uh, that represent a total of 132 species. So the way I'm gonna go about this is to um, first outline some of our, our general patterns that we observed. And then I'm going to um, relate these to previous hypotheses um, that have been addressed in earlier work. So are the morpho groups independent lineages and um, are annuals derived from a, per a perennial background or vice versa? Okay, so first I'm gonna start with these observed patterns. And the most um, kind of impressive pattern um, is this really amazing phylogenetic geographic structure. So um, it's, it's startling. So this is the same phylogeny that I had on the, on the previous page, um, but now all of our tips have points. And these points um, are color coded to correspond with some major geographic um, regions in North and South America. Um, I've, I've similarly mapped each of these tips onto um, a map so that we can see them in geographic space. And then I've, I've color coded these tips to correspond with these geographic regions. Now, I am using some kind of political boundaries, um, but that's more just for all of us to get our heads around where I'm talking about here. Um, I, I am really thinking about these more as um, geographic areas where species are going to be moving freely. And I'm thinking here along the lines of, you know, the last several hundred thousand years with all of the glaciation cycles and such, um, where will these species or where have these species been potentially? So um, the top clade of our phylogeny is um, with the red tips is composed of species that are in uh, Northern California, east into um, the kind of central Rocky Mountains and then all the way north. So covering the Pacific Northwest up into Canada and Alaska. At the bottom half of the tree, at the very bottom, there's a, a clade with uh, green tips. And this is composed of species that are found in uh, coastal California, uh, Southern California and into Baja. And then the clay just above that is composed of multiple different smaller clades and, and multiple colors here. Um, the dark blue corresponds to species that are found primarily in kind of the central Southern Rocky Mountains and the Great Basin. Um, the light blue 
points are those that are found in uh, Texas. And then the orange ones are in Mexico and the yellow ones are in South America. And so um, I, I'm almost visualizing these corridors uh, where species can be moving. So this pattern I think is, is a very common one that we're seeing uh, in, in uh, groups of plants, but this is, this is so striking, I, it's really neat. Um, so, you know, I think a logical kind of next question is, well, you know, what do the more shallow clades look like? Uh, what do these uh, types of patterns show? So um, here I'm going to zoom in to a clade that I couldn't think of a good name for it. So I just named it based on its node. So this is node 872. <laughs> um, and it's composed of eight different species. And these species represent three of these different morphogroups. And um, they're relatively close to one another in geographic space. Um, this is a pattern that we see all throughout the phylogeny. And another really great example of this is just a few nodes up. Um, and that's node 834, uh, composed of 10 different species from three different subgenera. Um, and again, these are mostly kind of concerted or con, you know, confined there to the Pacific Northwest with a few little stragglers um, up, in, up in the northern part of the continent. Um, the next question that this calls to my mind is, well, what's happening with our taxonomy? Where, how, what does our taxonomy look in this framework? Um, and um, basically it's all over the place. So um, as an example, here's one of our widespread species. Uh, this is Castilea cusicii, that's widespread in the Pacific Northwest, and it's equally widely dispersed across that Northern uh, clade. And we see this over and over again uh, with, with some of our more widespread species. Uh, here's Castilea nana. Um, this one's primarily in uh, the Sierra Nevada and into the high elevation of, um, of Nevada. Um, here's a close relative of it, of it uh, Castilea pilosa, similarly widely dispersed. And perhaps um, you know, the most striking of patterns is the, the widespread Castilea miniata um, that's found all over the continent and popping up all over uh, each of our clades. So those are the two kind of major patterns that we were observing, um, you know, when, when we got our hands on this phylogeny. Um, and so now I want to turn our attention to the, to the hypotheses that uh, we were interested in examining. So first of all, our, our morphogroups independent lineages. So um, here we have the annual morphogroup uh, Colacus. Um, you can see that uh, while these species are found in um, many of our clades, um, they are inferred to be very closely related to one another uh, within each of their geographic zones. Um, and they share a relatively common ancestor uh, in these areas, um, but they are you know, spread across the tree. Uh, here's the Pilosa E morphogroup. Um, this is a group of perennial species that's found, um, you know, primarily in Western North America. Um, they're widely distributed uh, throughout that geographic clade that corresponds to the Pacific Northwest and the Rockies, um, but a few are found down here in um, the Southern California. Uh, we see a similar pattern in the more speciose uh, Palacentes morpha group. And again, in the Castilea morpha group, um, this particular one has more of its members in um, Mexico and um, Central and South America, which is why we see more, you know, of the uh, plot of the points down at the, the bottom of the phylogeny. Um, but, you know, there are a few that are popping up here in that Northern clade, uh, which probably correspond either to these California or perhaps these Rocky Mountain collections. And finally, um, the most speciose and widespread morpha group, uh, Euchroma. Um, the members of this morpha group are widespread um, both in geographic space and, and across the phylogeny. So um, another kind of, I think, logical next question is, well, yeah, maybe these, these morpha groups are widespread, but what about those alliances within each of the morpha groups? Perhaps they're more cohesive. Um, but the short answer to that is also no. Um, so 
you know, there's a bazillion different sections. So I'm not going to force you to look through all of these slides. I'm just going to show you a small representation of them. Um, but uh, you know, each of these sections is is again just very widely dispersed. So here's section hispidae, section septentrionales, section aphanes, which first looks like it's doing pretty well, you know, or it's you know pretty cohesive. Here's all of these uh, South uh, or Southern uh, California samples, but then notice that there's one or two that are popping up in this Northern clade um, that correspond probably to these, um, these kind of higher latitude um, individuals. And then finally, section uh, Vesigula. So, um, so that's kind of addressing the morpho group. Um, hypothesis. The last hypothesis that we were we were kind of looking at is uh, whether or not annuals are derived from perennials. And we saw a little bit of this earlier when we were looking at the, the annual morpho group, Colacus, um, but the annual form does occur in multiple places in the genus Castilea. And so this is a plot of all of these individuals. So, um, you know, I do think that um, we are seeing a bit of this pattern of annuals being derived from a perennial background. It's just that it's repeated in each of these geographic clades. You'll notice that those uh, yellow dots, the, the Colacus subgenus, the, the Colacus morpho group, um, they are, again, very tightly, closely related um, and sister to the rest of the, the tips that are in their geographic clades. Um, there are a couple of these additional sort of one-offs in the blue and the red, et cetera, um, but these could very easily be just reversals uh, to an annual habit uh, from a perennial background. So I do think that we are seeing that pattern, although admittedly it is a bit confusing. <laughs> okay, so just a recap um, of what we're, we're seeing generally from the chloroplast genome. Um, we've got this really incredible, strong phylogenetic geographic structure. Um, we're seeing that smaller clades are uh, composed of really um, different morpho groups that are relatively close geographically. Uh, widespread taxa appear in many clades uh, across the phylogeny. Um, major morphotypes appear to not be cohesive and perennials are potentially derived from an annual background. So our take home messages here are number one, taxonomy really doesn't follow uh, chloroplast phylogeny. And uh, number two, um, there is some suggestion here that morphology and molecules may be very much in conflict. Okay, so now I'm gonna step away from, from the chloroplast genome and, and talk about things that we're seeing when we incorporate evidence from the nuclear genome. And before I can really dive into this, I gotta tell you that um, you know, the, the work that we've done here is extremely preliminary. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just very preliminary. Um, the curation of our nuclear data set has been uh, a really, really big challenge. Um, it's, it was pretty clear uh, very quickly that um, we had a number of polyploids in our samples that um, we weren't aware of. I mean, it didn't really surprise us, but, but we can see it coming out in our molecular data. Um, we also don't have the genomic resources to sort out paralogs of these polyploids, um, or even to confirm that the, the regions of the genome that we were expecting to be single copy are in fact single copy. So um, when we were, trying to find this preliminary data set, we were being extremely conservative and, and removing loci and samples if there was ever a whiff of paralogy or um, a, a polyploidy. So um, this of course reduced the, the sample size of our, our data set down um, to only 20 nuclear loci. Um, and this particular um, um, analysis was done um, with the combination of the chloroplast and those 20 nuclear loci. So this is a species tree um, that is, um, I think it was made with SVD quartets. Um, there are 196 samples that went into this analysis representing approximately 72 species. 
So as I did with the chloroplast phylogeny, I'm gonna walk you through some of the patterns um, and our hypotheses of interest. So we again recover a pretty solid um, pattern of phylogenetic geographic structure. Um, it's not as tight as the chloroplast phylogeny, um, but these clades are, are definitely um, centered around some of these major uh, geographic um, features. Um, we do recover the uh, perennials being derived from an annual background. So here I have the annual tips colored in red and the perennial tips colored in blue. We continue to see that widespread taxa are not monophyletic. So we allowed Miniata to keep its varietal status in this analysis. We had tons of samples from each of the varieties. Um, and so um, these, these folks popped up across uh, the phylogeny. And then finally, we're seeing that morpha groups um, continue to be um, not cohesive um, or not in cohesive lineages. Um, and so here I've got, you know, the tips color coded according to four of our major morpha groups. We also began to see this kind of interesting pattern where um, really unexpected sister pairs um, were popping up. And the only way that we could really explain these sister relationships were that um, these samples were geographically close to one another. So the, the one that I've boxed here in red um, is this pair of species. So um, this is Castilea cremosa on top and Castilea cyneria on bottom. Um, you know, presumably they are not sharing pollinators uh, based on their morphology, um, but yet they are, um, you know, placed as sister in the species tree. Um, the only way that we can really reconcile this is the fact that these two samples were taken uh, less than three miles apart. So there, this actually pops up in multiple places in the species tree. And so this is where these additional red boxes are. Okay, so um, those are the patterns that we were seeing in the chloroplast phylogeny and in our species tree. And so now I want to, to kind of put them together and um, to talk about where we're sitting right now um, with systematics in Castilea and, and what we think about its evolution. So um, first I wanna talk a bit about what we think is happening um, with speciation in the group. Um, so, you know, we're in the process of, of trying to find ways to test this and um, illustrate what we think. Um, but right now, all I can offer you is a verbal model, <laughs> um, but it's, it's a good one. So here it goes. Um, okay. so. You know, we know that in the last several hundred thousand years, there have been um, glacial cycles that have really um, led to repeated events of expansion and contraction of floras all across North, Western North America, especially. And what this does is it leads to cycles of isolation and secondary contact uh, between populations of species. And, and, and we think that Castilea, of course, was experiencing this, but throughout this entire process, uh, reproductive compatibility was somehow maintained. And because that reproductive compatibility was maintained, the, the genomes, um, particularly the organeller genomes, were allowed to move freely um, throughout these, these expansion and contraction cycles. And this probably happened at, at multiple extremes. So when the ranges were contracted, um, species from the same geographic areas shared the same refugia, most likely, and they were exchanging genes. But then as the ranges expanded, species from different areas came into contact, and again, they were exchanging genes. And so um, at the same time, you know, something is maintaining the morphological continuity of these species. And, and what that is that's maintaining it, you know, we don't know. It could be um, some sort of specific back crossing, um, pollinator preferences, species abundances, et cetera. Um, but ultimately it, it, something is keeping the morphological integrity for the most part of species, even in the face of all this frequent hybridization. And um, with this model, it's, it's um, 
really kind of fun to think about Van Valen's um, multi-species concept. So he talks about sets of broadly sympatric species that exchange genes and incomplete reproductive isolation of species permits better evolutionary adaptation. So I think it's a really neat idea to think that this could be a strategy that Castilea is employing um, to make it through um, difficult times, I guess, or um, that it's employing just in, in its um, process of evolution. So I have one more wrap up slide, but before I do that, I wanna take us back to um, some of our, one of the intro slides. Um, remember when I, I talked about this process oriented view of species and, and, and I mentioned like this linear bifurcating illustration um, that's all orderly and, and clean and neat and tidy, uh, this can be misleading. And I think this is a really good time to point out that a better model um, for Castilea and other species like this or other groups of species like this probably looks something a bit more like this, right? So, um, you know, like the braids of a river channel or um, the hydrology of a mountainside, you know, we see, um, we see these kind of major uh, lineages with um, small lineages peeling off. And um, maybe that happens a lot at times and other times it doesn't happen so much. Some of those, those things persist and others of them die out. Um, but many of these converge only, or I'm sorry, di diverge only to converge um, yet again down the road. Um, this type of a model I think is, is probably more realistic and um, thinking about uh, trying to find ways to model this and to test this, I think will be much more fruitful for us in, in Castilea. Okay, so, um, so now I wanna think about what this means for systematics in the group. And ultimately, if, if we desire a classification that reflects phylogeny, um, then we have a problem. <laughs> so um, I think what I've shown today kind of um, is a good illustration of how complex the molecular history is in this group and how at odds it is with current taxonomy if we expect that that taxonomy reflects phylogeny. Um, I think it also uh, strongly suggests that perhaps our species boundaries are very poorly understood. You know, a lot of this is, is predicated on what we call species now. And if those were defined a bit differently, maybe these patterns would look a little different. Um, ultimately, I do think that we need a more comprehensive set of data and appropriate methods, um, both to inform species, but also to, to think about systematics in the group as a whole. And so my research is really going to be trying to um, build those comprehensive data sets to push at this problem. So from a morphological perspective, we really need to be collecting morphological data very consistently across all samples. Um, I also think that we need to try to quantify additional um, traits across our samples. Um, gathering data about pollinators and, and soil and hosts, I think may be very informative uh, about what's happening with the group. From a molecular perspective, uh, we definitely need additional genomic resources to help us discern our various sources of variability. <laughs> um, one of my biggest pushes right now is to generate a, a high quality reference genome. Um, this is gonna be kind of a really important source for lots of different molecular kind of reasons. Um, but one that I'm really excited about is to try to really dig into contemporary gene flow and um, some of these hybrid zones that we're seeing. So in my head, I'm thinking of that um, Linerifo Linerifolia pilosa example that I mentioned. Uh, earlier on. I do think we need to be taking ploidy estimates of all of our samples. Um, we need to do this to help us accommodate paralogs in the group, but I also think that ploidy could be uh, a really interesting trait um, to, to contribute to our understanding of evolution in, in the group. And finally, we need more informative loci. Uh, we spent a lot of time and, and resources um, pushing towards these um, you know, Castilea specific nuclear primers, but ultimately they're not very variable. So we, we need to explore additional sources of variable loci uh, in the group.
So um, kind of in a similar vein, if we assume that morphology reflects relatedness, um, we also have a problem. And, and this idea that morphologies should somehow track phylogeny, um, I think it's very logical, but that's not necessarily um, the end all be all <laughs> of how we're going to understand relationships in this group. You know, perhaps selection isn't acting exclusively on floral morphology. You know, quite likely there are um, uh, ecological opportunities that um, are potentially driving diversification more so than pollinators perhaps. Um, this makes a lot of sense if we, when we think about the context that the, the kind of geographic context that Castilea is evolving in. Um, maybe there's something here about um, hosts and um, who the hosts are and what kinds of adaptations they might, um, um, or what types of, uh, kind of um, benefits those relationships confer outside of just uh, water and photosynthates. Um, but in all of these cases, um, I think it just goes to show that maybe we shouldn't necessarily expect that morph morphology is going to predict phylogeny in the group. And then I, I really do feel like I need to just address this question. So <laughs> what does this mean about taxonomy? I mean, I feel like the entire talk has been about how much our taxonomy is kind of confusing matters, or at least not tracking the phylogeny. Like, what does this tell us then about what we're trying to do when we're in the field, trying to put a name on something? Um, and the short answer is, is I don't know. <laughs> um, I think that taxonomy in this group is just, it's just gonna be hard probably for quite a while. And I wish I had a better um, answer to that. And maybe this can come up in discussion in the question and answer section. But um, you know, ultimately, I do think that we need to be consistently trying to identify species as, as best we can. But ultimately, we need a new classification. And this is one of the large kind of farther reaching goals that I do have in, in this group, um, working towards an updated classification that considers the genus across its entire range, um, ultimately building a monograph of the genus. So um, I'm pretty excited about that. It's gonna be challenging, but it, it'll, it'll be good. Okay, so for my last slide, I just wanna end with some, some pretty pictures uh, of Castilea. And I also um, want to challenge the audience to guess how many species um, are amongst these, um, pictures. <laughs> 